pretty neat spot. We've, uh, we've just completed our journey from home to Atlantic Canada, and I'm standing at the foot of St. Margaret's Bay looking out at the Atlantic Ocean. And from a historian's perspective, it's, uh, it's pretty neat because uh, this is where it started. This is where you know, indigenous people looked out, and as they referred to them, they saw these big canoes with the white sails and European starts, and we have a 400 plus year history on this continent. And our journey was pretty quick. So 1,700 kilometers is approximately 1,000 miles. We did it in a couple of days with one stop. But what I want to do today is relate a, a wee bit of history about a similar journey made by a group of very hardy men uh, in 1813 in the war against the states. So the story I'm going to relate today um, involves the 104th Regiment from New Brunswick. And there's a lot of uh, accounts of the different regiments uh, during the War of 1812. But the 104th sort of falls off the radar. We, we know a lot about the 49th Regiment of Foot. They were Sir Isaac Brock's Regiment, the King's 8th, etc. But the 104th, uh, I think, have an, uh, an undeserved, unrecognized uh, account of them. So uh, what happens in mid-February in 1813, they're... they're, they're Station in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and they're ordered to, on foot, uh, travel to Kingston, Ontario. So, a journey of about 1,200 kilometers, and it's the dead of winter. Uh, it's one of the coldest winters uh, in decades, and the snow depth is just incredibly high. So, they're issued uh, a single blanket, um, a great coat, mittens, moccasins, snowshoes, and one toboggan per two men and off they go. Uh, they don't even have shelters. They're making shelters at night by digging tunnels in the snow and putting boughs across the top and lighting fires inside to keep, keep alive. Anyway, they, they make the trek and they do arrive uh, on April 19th, so long trek, but they run out of food two weeks in. And uh, they're frostbitten, they're literally starved to death. The hunting was pretty much impossible due to the depth of snow. I kind of like to think that if, if you think about feats of endurance, this is a remarkable one in history. It's sort of right up there with, with Shackleton's survival in the Antarctic region. Uh, anyway, they arrive there, and then they're not there too long. On April 29th, they're about 300 of the 104th are sent to Sackett's Harbor uh, for the battle that took place there. Uh, and in that battle, 21 die and 65 are wounded. And back to Kingston they go, and then it's not that awful long. In the same year, they're ordered to march to Niagara Falls in the Fort Erie area. Again, another long, long trek. And they take part in the night assault at Fort, at Fort Erie. And in that assault, 70% of the men are lost in the uh, 104th Regiment. So fascinating group of very hardy men that made, a tr made the trip we make look uh, awful easy. In, in our modern times. So while we're down here, we're, we're going to be doing a number of things, but the, one of the highlights is going to be a live shoot with our black powder muskets. And um, I thought I'd talk a wee bit about the history of marksmanship. So it actually goes back a long way, uh, long before for things like this were, were ever invented. So we're going to go back to uh, about 400,000 years ago or so when we know that cavemen first started to nap these points that they attached to sticks, making a spear that they would throw. And obviously they had to practice marksmanship. And, you know, big critters coming after them and, and, and they needed food. So that's sort of the start of marksmanship. So the first pictorial representation we have it is about 1400 BC in ancient Egypt. Um, so and that, sh that, that, that uh, cave drawing shows um, uh, a bunch of archers around a target with these closely placed arrows. So obviously, perhaps even a game or a competition. Uh, and then we go ahead to biblical times. And in my opinion, one of the most fascinating uh, examples of marksmanship, when we've got two armies that are about to collide. So we have, uh, we have David. He's a, he's a shepherd. And he doesn't know it yet, but he's going to be the future king of Israel. And, and then we got this Palestinian fellow, and he's a big lad. Oh, some would call him a giant, named Goliath. And two armies are about to meet, and thousands of men are going to die. 
and be wounded. And the decision is made to, well, why don't we resolve this by having David and Goliath meet out on the field, and the winner, other army, will secede to the other army, and, and, and we'll get on with things. And it'll just be one death, presumably. Anyway, Goliath, or sorry, David, he picks a stone, a simple little stone and a sling. And, and this Goliath fellow, he's got all this armor on and shields and stuff and these big swords, and they meet on the field. Goliath, Goliath I can just sort of imagine him chuckling at this little shepherd guy. Anyway, the little shepherd guy, he winds up with his sling, and he flings a rock, and it takes Goliath right there, right between the eyes, and kills him dead on the spot. No bloodsheds uh, of thousands of men is, is saved, and um, yeah, the, well, the rest is history. So there are a couple of sayings about marksmanship. One is to hit the mark. Uh, the other one is to miss the mark. And in, in marksmanship, anybody that does any kind of shooting with firearms or with arrows or throwing knives, it doesn't matter. There's always some pressure on you. Um, if we think about David and Goliath, a pretty high pressure stake should he miss that shot. Um, and I'll, I'll relate another story that has equally as much pressure, and we're going to move forward to 1307. And this fellow named William Tell. So uh, at this time, Swiss, uh, the Swiss people are occupied by the Austrians, and they don't like that much. Anyway, this uh, Austrian bailiff, he comes into town, and he puts his hat down in the square. And he orders every, everybody that's present to put their silver and coins in it. Well, William Tell is going to have no part of this. So the bailiff, uh, he, he uh, with his armed, armed force there, he orders William Tell to shoot an apple off his son's head. Uh, now, and, and the bailiff's thinking, well, he's probably going to kill his son. It's quite a range he's shooting from, and, and he'll get his revenge for William not throwing his silver into his hat. So William, he, he gets in position, and he shoots that apple right in two off his son's head, doesn't touch a thing. Well, the, now the bailiff's really, really upset because... He thought he'd get his revenge. He thought pretty confident the son would be killed. So he orders William Tell jailed. Spends a few days in jail, but he manages to escape. Now he lays in ambush, and, and he kills the bailiff. And he goes on, in, in history, he goes on to organize the Swiss army that eventually freed themselves from the Austrians. So, yeah, pretty high stakes uh, uh, shooting match. Well, ours aren't nearly, nearly that high stake, and, and we're going to be doing some shooting with our old flintlocks here. Um, and they seem like a primitive weapon, but they absolutely fascinate me. Um, it starts off with an arquebuse, and then they had wheel locks, they had snap locks, then they invented the flintlock. And, and this technology stayed pretty much unchanged for almost 300 years. Anyway, we're going to go out and see if we can, uh, we can hit some gongs at 50 yards or so. And, and I'm no William Tell. I'm certainly no uh, David, that shepherd guy David. But we're going to have some fun with our smoke poles while we're here. This is what spring looks like in Atlantic Canada. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was up at Bow Beckett's, a crazy good blacksmith up on uh, the south shore of uh, Lake Huron, or, or near Lake Huron, and crazy good blacksmith. And, and now we're down here in Atlantic Canada, and I'm going to get to meet a couple of fellows that I've been exchanging mail with, but uh, never got to meet, and they both are blacksmiths. So I, in three weeks, I'm meeting three blacksmiths, and uh, it's going to be pretty neat. I'm going to take you over and introduce you to them. Tell me about this coal that you were telling me about earlier. The old magic coal from Cape Breton, yes. Well, and not to knock Cape Breton coal, because we've had some of our best from Cape Breton, but we've also had some of our worst. We had a load of magic coal one summer, a few ton of it, unfortunately. And uh, you put one scoop of coal on the forge, about 15 minutes later, you take two scoop of clinker out. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it was hot, burned hot for that 15 minute window, but that was all you got was 15. Oh, by golly, we finally meet. Nick Skinner. Good to meet you, Peter. Peter, Peter Kelly, yes. Good to see you, Pete. Samuel Laguerre. Yeah? What? You guys are a couple of blacksmiths from, from uh, the East Coast here in Nova Scotia. And, uh, we're going to be, uh, they put down there, you make lots of noise with your hammers. You're always ringing on the anvils and such. But today they're going to quit that noise. We're going to make a little noise with these uh, smoke poles here. Eh? We're going to go off and do some food. Something good idea. That's what I'm hoping for. There you go. Anyway, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Uh, I'm Nick Skinner. I'm uh, owner and cutler of Seth Mountain Forge, and uh, we specialize in making 18th century and 19th century knives for uh, soldiers, hunters, kitchens, you name it. I can, we make it all. I can certainly attest to the quality of Nick Nick's blades. Uh, I've had numerous blades made, made by knife smiths uh, across this country and, and none quite compared to Nick's. Anyway, he's gonna, you are gonna give us a little show of some of your wares a little later on. Yep, I've got some of them along with me and we'll have a look at those a little bit later. Perfect, looking forward to it. How about you, young fella? I'm Samuel Legier, Sam, it works just fine. I'm a blacksmith's apprentice at Ross Farm Museum, learning a thing or two about shoeing oxen and making farm implements, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And the Ross Farm's a sort of mid-1800s uh, working museum? Yeah, it's museum. a pretty widespread. We go about 1830 to 1910. Perfect. We're actually going to be going out there and getting a tour of that. It's a lovely place. Yeah, lovely place. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to that. So our focus on, on our episode today is um, marksmanship of the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Uh, and... Uh, we're going to uh, be shooting our black powder guns and hopefully giving, I guess, kind of a tutorial. We'll maybe get you to do that, uh, Nick, on, on loading procedure and what you're loading and charge and stuff. And Nick's gracious enough to invite us out to the, um, what do you call it, the Blue Mountain? Blue, Blue Mountain, Mountain Long Rifles. Long Rifles Club. So here we are. they got a little clubhouse. We're going to get the wood stove going. and Because this is spring. Oh, this is white stuff. I don't know. We, we pretty much lost this in Ontario, but... This is central Nova Scotia spring. Yeah, yeah this is a wet spring. And yeah. oddly enough, we come right from the Atlantic Ocean this morning, and there wasn't a speck of snow down there. No. So we're a bit higher and a little bit further inland. We're, we're in what, inland. we're in what they call the snow belt. The snow belt. There you go. <laughs> Obviously, when does it go away? Uh, usually sometime during April. It'll uh, melt <laughs> off. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, well, shall we head over to the range and see if we can make some noise? Sounds good to me. Great. Before we go off and and uh, dirty up these smoke poles and hopefully hit something, I'm not sure. I, I got awful old eyes, Nick. <laughs> I can see the target or I can see the sight, but I can't focus on both. I'm not much better. We'll see if we can put a hole in a piece <laughs> of paper. But um, so Nick's laid out some of his stuff here, and and I I an amateur blacksmith so i i made a few hatchets and some knives and some frying pans and such but these are literally works of art and uh, anyway nick i'll let you explain what you got here and what's involved and first of all though how the heck did you start like you've how did i get started it. well i grew up in a household uh where we had a huge library and uh my parents believed in catering towards our interests my interest was history and a lot of my interest in history revolved around weapons. So either flintlock, percussion guns, or knives, swords, that kind of thing. But when I was a little kid, my father had this out in the workshop. And this was a crooked knife, which was uh, and is still used uh, by a lot of our uh, indigenous peoples. And... Um, this was also a knife that uh, a lot of people where my grandmother were from, uh, up in North Kings County, got, uh, they, they took a shine to these, and uh, these are a great little knife. They used them for making everything, mm -hmm. from whittling to uh, making baskets. Uh, you can make a canoe with that. That's, uh, that's what uh, my wife and I, we have a bit of a passion, and we build birch bark canoes, so uh, we have few crooked knives in it, but they, this one feels exceptionally good in the hand. Uh, it doesn't have the curl on the end, it's just a knife, it's like a draw knife, but uh, that is a fine tool. Yeah, fine tool indeed. And this knife here would be an example of one of my early pieces from when I was 16. It doesn't look like much, but I like keeping these around because they kind of remind me of where I came from, and <laughs> I can look ahead to where I'm going too, right? Yeah. Right. This is one of my first Bowie knives. I made this, uh, I was actually going to an encampment out at Ross Fern. We had a little military encampment out there and I wanted a Bowie knife. Um, I was quite an avid uh, mid 19th century reenactor. Bowie knife, right? That's a very early Bowie knife. Uh, it has strong Mexican influence or Spanish influence. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the blade design is, and the handle design is very colonial Spanish. And uh, you'll find a lot of that influence very early on in uh, a lot of the early Bowie knives. <laughs> and even in some of the knives that predate the uh, era we know as the Bowie era, of yeah. like the uh, 1830s and on, right. uh, like you'd see something like that in the 1820s. Right. Yeah. The Alamo comes to mind. Yes, and I think it was after his, after James Bowie's knife fight on the sandbar down there that uh, uh, people start labeling, labeling this as a, a Bowie, Bowie knife. knife. Yeah, got yeah. Name. Before that, they were really, they were really just a knife. I can art, I <laughs> it's can just art, a big knife. As, I mean, as a fine blade, I can already lift the darn thing, eh? And Nick can wield it. I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> right? imagine that. Wow. Well, that's pretty amazing stuff, Nick. And uh, just one last one I'm really curious about this guy. What what would that be a reproduction of? That is a contemporary reproduction of a Confederate D-guard Bowie of the American Civil War. Um, big Bowie knives like that were quite popular down in the South uh, during the early war. Mm -hmm. um, they it didn't take very long for them to start discarding them because they were just heavy and heavy cumbersome. to carry and they didn't often yeah. have the chance to use them up close and personal but they did no. kind of like that kind of fight yes, didn't they, they yeah from whatever it yeah you know, accounts of the civil war history yeah well well that's pretty amazing stuff Nick. well so um what do you think should we go see if we can get some targets why not We've got our muskets ready. We're ready to head off and make some noise, but just a, a wee bit of history about uh, the flintlock musket. So um, it basically starts to come and play around 1620 with a, without the actual uh, prison being flogged, but it had a cap sort of thing. So the musket, as we know, 1620, 1640, stays pretty much unchanged for 200 years until um, the, the sort of the mountain man era, the 1820s, I think about 1821, the percussion cap comes into play. So we're, we've got muskets here um, that span a, basically a century. So we'll start with the oldest, which would be the one I'm carrying. And this would have been a, an early English trade musket. So it would be circa uh, 1690s to about 1720 or so. And it, it has a lot of French influence, so the 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 comb and the drop in the stock, uh, which is a damn miserable thing on my cheekbone <laughs> when you've got a heavy charge in it. But uh, and then we're going to move from this one to yours, Nick. So what are you what are you? Mine there? is a classic uh, mid eighteenth century uh, American smoothbore, and uh, it's. A uh, very near copy of one from the Lehigh Valley area in Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful one. And its caliber? This is a 28 gauge. 28 gauge, yeah. Yeah, and I'm so it'll be about a 56 caliber. Right. And I'm shooting 62, both uh, both smooth bars. And what do you got there, Samuel? Well, this is a Northwest Trade gun, very popular, late 18th, early 19th century, also 62 caliber. Uh, as the name would imply, often traded with the indigenous. Mm -hmm. Got a few features on it that they really liked. This nice serpent character on the side, which was sought after, and a great big old trigger guard here. Pretty handy little piece. Man, it's 62 caliber. 62 as well, as well yeah. Smooth bore. So the smooth bore musket, we're all shooting smooth bores. Um, people say they're just inaccurate. You can't hit the side of a barn door, but that's not true. Um, Take some experimentation with patch and ball size, and mine's tighter shooting than either of these two, so it's a little more finicky. Um, but they were a very versatile musket, so we can shoot single ball projectiles. We can shoot uh, shot, which we carry. We won't be doing that today, but for foul hunting and what have you. Or if your eyesight isn't all that great, <laughs> shot with buckshot. Like shot I do. works good. <laughs> <laughs> I can hit something then. But uh, so if you think about the rifled barrels, we think about the American frontier, we think about Daniel Boone and a rifled musket. Well, rifles, I would say for every single rifled musket in the States, there was probably 75 or 95 uh, smooth bores. They were the common man's gun and a much more versatile weapon. Anyway, let's go make some noise. Sounds good. Sounds good.
Okay, Nick's going to go through the complete uh, loading of a flintlock musket. How uh, And Nick and I load pretty much the same. So right now the gun's in what the military would call open panties springs. And it was the easiest uh, way to, in a non-loaded position, to to take the wear off the, off the machinery, if you would. So the first thing Nick's going to do is he's going to go to half cock on his musket. And that's called the cock, not the hammer. He's going to put a vent pick in the, in the vent hole. I do the same thing. And then he's going to put his powder charge in. And what I find in doing it this way is that when you've, when you've packed your ball down on top of the charge, you're leaving a little tunnel into the main charge in the barrel. So at this point, Nick's going to get out uh, his powder measure. So contrary to powder or popular myth, they didn't just shake powder down from the horn. Uh, they measured it out. To just dump powder in, you would have horrible accuracy. You may have a, basically a bomb in your hand if you put too much in. So Nick's got a measurement that works for his musket. He's using triple F. Not sure uh, what we have for for a charge there. About 60 grains. Do 65. We 65 grains of black powder. Triple F. And he's got his grease, grease patch cloth. And it's a 62 caliber, so 0 0.62. And Nick's using, he casts his own balls, and, and they're 0 0.60. So uh, they don't work so good in my musket. It's got a little bit tighter uh, bore on it. But uh, So he's pushed that down. He's taken his patch knife. He's cutting off the, the material. Now he's going to start the ball. And he's going to seat it down onto his powder charge. Don't have to be too aggressive. He just wants it down. He wants all the air out of there and a nice firm little pop. Just like that. Replaces his ramrod. Now he's going to take out his bent pick. And he's going to charge his, his uh, flash pan. The secret to a good explosion isn't to, to overcharge it. A lot of people will fill that pan right up, and quite often it'll block the explosion into the vent. So I suspect Nick's doing about the same as me. About a third of the flash pan is filled, and uh, that should give him a good, quick ignition. So Samuel's got uh, Jenny all loaded up here with the charge, and he's going to demonstrate how he's going to um, charge the, uh, the flash pan. So you're, you're just going to flip the present open. It's going to take out the, the uh, vent pick. And I prefer, not always, you don't you don't have to, but I find just a slightly quicker ignition if I use really fine powder. So he's going to put in uh, 4F out of the priming horn. And the key is about a third of the basin filled. And another little trick he's going to show here, once it's filled, he's going to give it a little, once he's going to close the present, He's going to give it a quick flick to the right. That's going to push that powder all to the far right hand side of the flash pan. And that creates a, a space. So you get, I found you get less hang fires because you're going to get this explosion with nothing blocking that vent hole. It generally works. And uh, you'll see, just so you know, Samuel, she shoots a little low and a bit to the right. Yes, sir.